I fully believe that your success lies right on the other side of your comfort zone. For me personally, I say chase the butterflies. Welcome to a special edition episode of the Game Changing Attorney Podcast featuring the Firm of the Year award winners announced at the 2023 Crisp Game Changers Summit. Anytime that I feel nervous, apprehensive, a little bit sick to my stomach about a decision, that probably means I need to lean into it and go for it. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. Today, we're sharing my conversations with Ryan and Bo from Bo and Schmidt Entertainment Attorneys, Diego and Adriana from BBA Immigration, and Jan from Jan Dill's Attorneys at Law. Culture's non-negotiable. You might be a great person as far as a worker, but if you're not a good team member, and you're not a good fit, which is core values, then you're not going to work here. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Before we begin today's episode, I want to remind you that we aren't beholden to any sponsors or run any ads on this podcast. This allows us to present all of our episodes raw and unfiltered. I'm not going to push any made-to-order meal services on you or try to save you any money on your car insurance. That being said, I have one small request. If you receive any value from this podcast, please give it a five-star review. Pay the fee so we can keep this podcast free. To kick off this episode, we're joined by Ryan Schmidt and Bo Bowen of Bowen Schmidt Entertainment Attorneys out of Savannah, Georgia. As the country's foremost advocates for creatives, Bowen Schmidt empowers artistic pursuits while setting industry standards for safeguarding their legal rights. I began our conversation by asking Ryan and Bo about their motivations to enter the practice of law. My mom and dad, for years and years before I was born, they had a traveling vaudeville show called the Sid and Chuck Show, where they did singing, dancing, comedy skits, you know, all over. And, and they ended that just before I was born. When I was born, I was born in Columbus, Georgia. My dad was a newscaster. He had a children's show where he was Flaco the Clown, sponsored by Golden Flake Potato Chips. <laughs> And so they always loved show business and grew up on all everything entertainment related. You know, I can't say that I had this burning passion to be a lawyer since I was a child, but as I got older, I think there were things that had so much influence on me and, and two movies in particular, one being Inherit the Wind. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, uh, but it's, it's incredible. It's about the Scopus Monkey Trial and stars Spencer Tracy as the Clarence Darrow character in real life. And then uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Atticus Finch. I mean, come I thought on. you were going to say like my cousin Vinny or something. But just, <laughs> I was like, both of those movies just like spoke to me so much, particularly Atticus Finch, but just, I mean, that superhuman empathy he had for other people and just realizing that you can use this as something to help other people. It, you know, it really did motivate me to ultimately go to law school. Yeah. I started out doing corporate and just small business law, that type of thing, helping people get these businesses off the ground. And then as the entertainment industry started blossoming in Savannah, probably a little over 10 years ago, no one there was doing it. So someone, a, a movie, a director just got referred to me. They were like, hey, can you do entertainment law? Of course I can do entertainment law. Quickly Google, how do you do entertainment law? <laughs> you know, but uh, it went great. They referred me to the next person and within two years, it was the bulk of my practice. There you go. And then Ryan, what about you? I know we were talking about this uh, last week. I learned that you were on The Voice. Like this blew my mind, but what about your, your career as a musician? Absolutely. So lifelong musician, even when I was four years old, I, I loved playing music. And I remember I was in kinder music. My teacher in that class pulled my mom aside because I wasn't playing the notes that they said to play. I was playing my own thing. And she said, I think Ryan's the first kid I'm going to have to fail at kin kinder music. He just isn't isn't a musician. <laughs> and I think the opposite was true is that I always wanted to innovate and create. So I had that music gene very early. 
and I was writing music and making records in uh, in Boston when I was uh, in high school. And I would actually like call in sick to school, and I'd go to Boston and play a show or go to the studio and, and put out put out records. And I kind of built up enough of a following in the Boston singer songwriter scene that I got really well connected with Berkeley College of Music. And my my manager at the time was a professor at Berkeley, and of course the Voice they had these producers that are always out there scouting talent. There's the idea that you're one of a million people at an arena waiting for your shot, but the bulk of the people on that show have been very heavily vetted and approached. And I was one of them because of my connection through Berkeley, and they asked me to be on right out of undergrad. And I went out there. It was fantastic experience, but it really helps uh, create the stage for my music law career because these reality shows, they want to build this story around you. And at the time they said, Ryan, what is your story? And there was people that I was peers with on the show. They had been in this horrific car accident or they had, you know, this terminal cancer that they overcame. And I said, I'm Ryan, I play music. And they said, well, that's a terrible story. You know, you gotta, you gotta be better than that. So I, uh, they said, if it wasn't music, what would it be? And I said, in undergrad, I studied music business. I've always been fascinated in the legal side of how the music industry works because there's so many uh, horror stories of bad deals. And maybe if nobody turns around, I'll go to law school. And I said, that's it. You're the music law kid. That's your path. And then years later, you know, I'm, I'm kind of burnt out on, on just doing the music thing, you know, as a DJ. And I was like, maybe this is the time for a career pivot. Yeah. So how did you two like come together? I understand, Bo, you started the firm um, betting on yourself. And then how did you guys ultimately meet? Well, I was a solo practitioner at the time. I had attempted to work with other attorneys in the past, but it's so difficult to mesh with someone. Well, I mean, it's not just work ethic, but it's also, as you know, passion, you know, finding someone that just you gel with. And, you know, I kept getting this kid from Belmont Law School that kept emailing me saying, you know, I'll come and work with, with you for free for the summer. And, you know, I'd really like you to, to meet you. And finally, I was like, OK, if you want to work for free, come on in. So Ryan came in and interned one summer for me and we just really hit it off. Hired him right out of law school the next year and rest is history. As I understand it, just over time, you guys ended up kind of killing the golden goose. Right. So it was the, the, the corporate side of the practice. What led to, to that pivot? As you said, you know. I started out doing solely corporate and small business and the entertainment start, started growing and it was almost primarily completely film and television. And, and that's still what I focus on. And then when Ryan came on board, he handled all the music side, any music issues we came in. And then that started expanding a little bit, video games, esports, authors, what, you know, there's so many different parts of the entertainment industry, but really we have to credit crisp. I, I mean, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. We we had this corporate practice that was doing pretty well. And I would say any given year between 30 and 50 percent was entertainment. But we had this corporate practice and it was it was doing well. It was an hourly billable model and we could kind of predict what that business was going to be like. But it wasn't what we were passionate about. Every time we represented a film or got a good deal for an artist, we felt so good because we really felt in alignment with what we love to do. And so Chris, of course you, Chris's story of niching down to we serve attorneys, we were really inspired by that. And we knew that to be where we wanted to be, we had to chase that passion. So how did it go? I mean, I guess, you know, sometimes people wonder like how far you can niche down, how specific you can be, how narrow of a market you can serve. And people wonder like, well, is it still going to be, you know, lucrative? Is the practice still going to be able to be successful with a, with a smaller addressable market? Like, how's it worked out for you guys? Well, it was scary at the beginning, but it was also scary, honestly, to do a very small corporate practice at the very beginning, because the bulk of the corporate law practices are big, giant firms. And so I knew then if I'm going to compete, I have to set myself apart somehow, whether that's customer service, attention, just excellence in, in the product that we're generating, that type of thing, you know, really having to differentiate ourselves. And as Ryan and I talked about it, we realized entertainment law is even more so that way. The entire entertainment law industry is dominated by just several mega firms. And no one had ever even attempted anything like what we're doing. And so we took that same mindset. Can we 
offer something different that these creatives have maybe never had before, had never experienced, and people have started really reacting to it. So, Ryan, what would you describe? What's that differentiator? Like, what's the unique value proposition of the firm today? I think that there's so many entertainment lawyers out there, and I'm speaking to these big blue chip corporate firms that have worked in the entertainment industry in one way or the other for the last hundred years, but they also practiced 50 other practice areas, but they have got a, a network of 200 attorneys that do this. And their success is in, they've got a partner that represented Frank Sinatra, and then that partner retires and he gives his bill of business to somebody and somebody. And, and so that's kind of how that's worked and how new attorneys that come in end up being these Hollywood reporter, you know, entertainment lawyers of the year. But it's kind of the that funnel, the, the corporate uh, blue chip big law funnel doesn't breed lifelong creatives and creative advocates. It's, it's more of a system. So what we want to do with what we do, we, we both came from these entertainment backgrounds. We've worked on both sides of the entertainment industry that we're not just these suits. You know, we've been in the trenches with you so we can actually empathize with our clients and understand what it really is that they're fighting for. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of empathy, Bo, when your clients reach out to you, what are some of the challenges that they're experiencing? So whether it's an artist, an esports athlete, just anything across the board, I imagine it's, you know, the, the commonality they share is maybe to some degree they either don't know what they're doing or they're being taken advantage of. But like, I guess you, you, you could speak to it. Oh, absolutely. It's much more so in the music industry. People just prey upon, you know, these dreams that people have of being successful. And it's not quite as much in the film and television industry, but it definitely still exists. You know, the, the people are given these opportunities and you have to be very careful when you review those initial contracts. But what I really enjoy the most, though, is it's kind of like when you go back to the corporate side, when somebody wants to start a new business from scratch and you kind of help them build it from the ground up. It's these people that they're really coming in with just this dream of, I want to make this movie or I want to make this project and being able to sit down with them step by step, walk them through exactly what they're going to have to do and see it go all the way from idea to the screen. So there's nothing more fulfilling to me than that. Do you have like an example? That I, you may not have to name the particular client or I don't know if you can, but just something that was just like a transformational experience, some impact that you guys made that you kind of references, you know, if it were not for you, maybe this project wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. At this point, because I've been doing this for over a decade now. I mean, the, I can give you multiple examples of that. But it, And one example, even where a person went on to win an Academy Award based upon their project. So I have seen people that have come in that have never created a movie, never even been involved in a production. I'm not going to say I single-handedly walk them through it. A lot of it is introducing them to the right people putting them in touch with, you know, the right networks and everything to, and watching that all come together. And now some of those people that started with just one single idea have now gone on to make three, four, five motion pictures. So it's really rewarding as someone, you know, coming from that background and knowing how difficult it is to see our clients go on to have that kind of success. Yeah. And there's a saying, it's like, it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. I'd love to speak to the, the culture of the firm. Um, Ryan, how would you define the culture? I think our culture now is steeped in accountability and it's steeped in enthusiasm for our clients and what we're hoping to help them achieve. That's been really transformational. When we shifted to entertainment law and we started really focusing on our passion to be these creative advocates it really allowed us and our team to celebrate the wins of our clients in a completely different way. Yeah. Leonard Bo, you, you mentioned this earlier, just the, the client experience, the, the focus on service. Like, are there any specific things that you all do that you, you believe is a differentiator? One thing we remind ourselves before we meet with a client for the first time is that this may well be the first time they have ever met with a lawyer before. And they're going to probably be nervous about it. They're not going to know what to expect. They're going to be thinking, Oh my gosh, how expensive is this going to be? You know, they're going to have all these worries. And so we always make it a point to take the first five, 10 minutes, whatever it takes, just to get to know the person, sit down, make them feel comfortable. We've had so many people that later have left us reviews and said, wow, after 
five minutes, I felt like I had known them my entire life. Uh, they, they felt like best friends. And, and that's, to me, what it's about, you know, making somebody in a situation where they need help but also making them feel so comfortable and, and to where they trust you because we do, that is what we want to do. We want to help them and we want to make sure they know that. Yeah. So I guess from a, from a client perspective, obviously there's going to be those initial worries. There's obviously the unknowns, like how do they even go about finding the right lawyer? I mean, as you can imagine, obviously we talked about some of the more corporate lawyers, but they don't know who's going to take advantage of them and who isn't right. So like if you were speaking to a client, how would you recommend that they vet the right partner? I think it all comes down to what is your goal? If your goal is to, you've already got all of these resources behind you and you simply want to go somewhere where they're going to be able to pick up the phone and immediately call Netflix because you've got $10 million sitting there in the bank ready to make this production. You know, maybe you do go to a large firm, but if you were the clients that we target, the people that are trying to make these independent productions that are really starting out their career and are worried, are we being taken advantage of? What can we do to advance? Then what you really want to look for is somebody that not only understands you and cares about you, but really has that passion to make certain that you're protected. And that's what we try to convey to every person we meet with. So over the years, I, I want to kind of reflect on just the experience of, of growing the practice. I imagine there's always lessons that you learn along the way. Um, Ryan, I'll start with you, but just looking back, if you could give like young Ryan some advice right when you joined the practice, like is there anything you would have done differently then that you know today? I think I would have leaned into entertainment a lot sooner because we had entertainment law on our website and we were taking entertainment cases, but we weren't focusing our time and our energy into putting that out in the world. We weren't making content around that. We weren't marketing that this was really something we did. We just had a local awareness from people that already knew us that we did entertainment. I think that we would have got to where we are now and where we want to go a lot quicker had we recognized that passion, leaned into it, and really put our foot in the gas. Yeah. But what about you? Just looking back, any particular lesson that stands out, like things that you know today that if you can go back and say, now that I know this, if I could advise my younger self, I would have made this different decision or different choice. I think Ryan is exactly right. When we made this decision, I had already been practicing well over 25 years. I felt like I was getting toward the end of my career. And so, of course, I'm resistant to, look, am I going to trust this company, Chris? Am I going to really change the way I've been doing it for so long? And seeing Ryan's passion about it was so inspiring to me that then I came with him to one of your conferences and was just blown away by it. And, and it really invigorated me as, as an attorney and as a person. When you do focus on what you actually are passionate about, it comes through. And now, anytime anything happens in the entertainment industry, we immediately get calls. We get requests for interviews. And it just snowballed from there because of that passion we have for it. In fact, we, um, I just got a call last week where I got invited to go to Sundance next month and represent Georgia, basically, and talk to all these people that make independent movies and explain to them why they should come to Georgia to film their next production. And that never would have happened at any other point in my career had we not focused on entertainment law. So follow up to that. Why should they come to Georgia? Well, look, it's the best place in the world to film. You've got the climate here. You've got the best crew base that you can find anywhere in the world. You, when you talk about the scenery here, I mean, you've got everything. It can fill in for any point in history and you've got then the incentives on top of that. So there is no better place. I'm not as familiar with the, with the history of this. Obviously you guys know, but it just seems like in recent years that Georgia just has exploded as a place where they're filming all sorts of movies and shows. Obviously, a large part of that is attributable to the, you know, to the, to the tax incentives. But do you know what, like, what the catalyst was for all that? Well, the tax incentives were a major part of it because there is definitely a reason it's called show business. Because when you could save them the dollars, that's going to help. But then, once you grew that crew base here and you grew the infrastructure, all the sound stages, all those things, where it's just a one-stop shop. Georgia went from a footnote in the entertainment industry to literally the number one place in the world to film above the United Kingdom, New York, California, everywhere. 
And so it's just been, you know, so gratifying to see that happen. Yeah. I want to shift back to uh, to the firm itself. I mean, obviously you guys have had a tremendous growth rate, very much, you know, abnormal in many ways in a good way. Um, what do you attribute that to? I think one of the things is being attuned to opportunities and knowing when to take risks. I fully believe that your success lies right on the other side of your comfort zone. And I say, for me personally, I say chase the butterflies. Anytime that I feel like nervous, apprehensive, a little bit sick to my stomach about a decision, that probably means I need to lean into it and and go for it. And whether whether it's personally or professionally, the best things that I've achieved and accomplished have been when I was scared to do something. But that's because you're hitting the limit of what you're currently capable of. And you're never going to grow if you don't take that that leap. Yeah. But what are your thoughts? This is, a, a, you know, trying to blow smoke up your ass, Michael, but, but we certainly attribute a great deal of our success to what we've learned through your program. There has not been one single meeting that we have come to that we haven't walked away with something that we have implemented immediately that has had a tremendous impact on what we do. But when you put the focus on protecting the clients and doing something that no other entertainment firm has ever done, we don't just look at how can we help this particular client, but how can we actually change the industry to protect all potential clients? That's really our goal. And I think that's what helps us stand out. And that's what's attracted attention and clients to us. That's actually a perfect segue. I'd love if you guys could talk about just some of the things you're doing just industry-wide, even for the community with um, the Savannah Film Alliance, Georgia Music Partners. What are those all about? Well, I founded the Savannah Film Alliance as a way of trying to get everyone in the entertainment industry locally there in the Savannah region together, not just as a networking thing, but rather, how can we combine our different talents, our different resources, our different areas of expertise to identify what may be holding Savannah back, what can we do to work together to help it grow, and it's resulted in some tremendous changes in the way that we do things and also just the growth of the entertainment industry in Savannah overall. It's, it's been very exciting. And so one of the things that, that personally I've found most fulfilling about it is we looked at the fact that almost every industry at the end of the year has some kind of gala or award ceremony, you know, whether you're talking about doctors or insurance companies or whatever it is. And we're like, how does the entertainment industry not have that? You know, you've got, certainly have, you think of award shows like the Academy Awards and the Emmys and things like that, but the local industry had nothing. So that's when we decided on to form the, and create the Savannah Film Alliance Honors Gala. And the purpose of that was to not, pick, you know, who filmed the best movie in Savannah that year. Because, you know, you do that, you get one winner and four losers. <laughs> Instead, it was who were the people working behind the scenes that are really making a difference, that the people that come to Savannah leave going, wow, that person was amazing. I want to go back and work with them again and give them that moment in the spotlight. So each year that we've done it, we take eight people and we make it them the focus of the entire evening, give them the full celebrity treatment, you know, hack the venue and, and just really show what it means to be a success in a real life and to contribute to the growth of the industry. And that's been really fulfilling. I love it. I love it. Ryan, what, what excites you just looking ahead to the future of the firm? I am really excited about the good that we can do in the entertainment industries for each representation, we're really making it a point to educate and empower creatives. And there's so many other firms that try to gatekeep that information. They say, we spent all this time and money learning how this industry works. We want you to be dependent on us. Forget that. You know, we want our clients to know themselves how this business works. Because at least in the music industry, it was created to confuse artists. So they didn't know how bad their deals were. So if we can educate our clients, this is what to look out for. This is why I'm doing this. They are now in a position to be more self-reliant and protect themselves out in the world. As far as setting new industry standards, you know, we are constantly working with contracts that are trying to shoehorn in AI 
use your voice, your name, your image in perpetuity without additional consent and compensation. And that's where we step in and we say in this new world of AI and the creative industry, we're going to set standards. We're not going to allow our clients to sign any agreements that aren't going to require additional consent and compensation. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, we talked about AI. I understand. I mean, you use AI, right? So there's many, many benefits to it. Um, what are, I mean, I know you've described just some of them, but just where do you see this moving and just from a, you know, an artist musician standpoint to some things to watch out for? Like, I imagine there's also things to get excited about. Oh, there's, there's so many great uses of AI. And I think that ChatGPT is really just scratching the surface of what is possible with generative AI and, and text-based AI. There's video, there's, there's images. But what I'm surprised about with, with AI is you think about where this technology was five years ago, you think it's going to replace maybe some rote data analytics, you know, it's going to, it's going to organize files. No, this is replacing some creative output that like art, artists work on. I think that uh, as we move forward, there's, there's not laws yet in place to protect the rights to somebody's voice. If you're not a celebrity, your image, if you're not a celebrity, there's a right of publicity for a celebrity, but everybody else who's equally capable of getting their likeness ripped off because of AI, they don't have those rights yet. And so there's federal legislation that's coming through that's being introduced that's looking to change that so that we all have these name, image, and likeness rights. So it's not enough to post on Facebook a paragraph that says you do not have the rights to, <laughs> to <laughs> yeah, use that's my, not gonna, my that's voice not or likelihood. That is not going to help. You are correct. <laughs> so as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney Podcast, I want to ask each of you, Bo, I'll start with you. What does being a game changer mean to you? I think it is looking at the status quo and thinking that's not enough. You know, this is, people have grown accustomed to expecting certain things out of not just the entertainment industry and the legal industry, but just society in general. But things don't have to remain the same. We can look at where the issues are, where people need to be protected, and whether it's having to go to the Capitol and argue for legislative changes or individual contracts one by one. We want to make a world where Every creative can follow their dreams. They can pursue their passions without having to worry that they are going to be taken advantage of, that they're going to get ripped off. That's our goal. And to us, that's being a game changer. Man, right? You top that? <laughs> Man, that was that's pretty really good. good. <laughs> For me, being a game changer is really clearly defining what your goal is and relentlessly and consistently pursuing that and ideally taking people along with the ride elevating them, educating them along the way. Next up, we're joined by Diego Bustillos and Adriana Bello of BBA Immigration in Houston, Texas. Recognized for expertly navigating the U.S. immigration landscape, they've paved the way for countless professionals and entrepreneurs to prosper in the United States and have the opportunity to achieve their own American dreams. I began our conversation by asking Diego and Adriana about their firm's humble beginnings. So we started the firm um, six years ago. Initially, it was just me until Adriana got her green card. And then she joined and we, we started the law firm basically out of a, a room in my house. And we started growing. People knew us a little bit uh, from word of mouth. And how we started the law firm is we, we came to the U.S. 11 years ago, right? And we both did our master's degrees. And I think for me, at least, I thought that it would be really easy, given my background back home, to be able to work and live in the United States. But every time I went to an interview, I was very focused on knowing who would sponsor me for a green card. And I'd go through the interview process, and by the end of the interview process, or second, third interview, I'd be like, will you sponsor my green card? It doesn't matter how qualified I was, it was just a hard no. And we started working at this consulting firm that provided support to outside attorneys. And when we saw what the other attorneys were doing, we said, well, why can't this be better? Why are you saying no to all these 
extremely qualified individuals who can bring value to the United States. We think that if we build out our case this way, all these people will be able to come into the United States and bring value to the economy, the environment, societal well-being, what it is they do. So we we suggested that, we started doing it, then we got our green cards and started working towards that, showing people that there is a way for them to bring their skills and bring value to the United States because we never wanted our clients to have to go through what we had to go through, like that rejection and frustration with with not having an option to be able to stay here. So we were really focused on quality. We were extremely focused on, on our product of what we presented to immigration services just being flawless. And it worked. And we started growing and, and we, got, we got to a point where we knew we needed business advice on how to outgrow because we are both very much attorneys and we love being attorneys and there were a lot of things that we didn't know and there were there, there were even more things that we didn't know that we didn't know we started looking for for options on who could help us do that and we're here now but it it has been a, a road filled with effort and uh commitment and passion for what we do i, I think 10 or 15, 15 years ago, you would have told me I, I would have been doing this. And I probably said, like, what do you mean? I don't even know what you're talking about. But I remember when I was working before, I'm big into mountain biking. And this is where, this was a big shift. And this person will call me all the time and, and thank me. 10 years later, thank me. You changed my life. This is a friend I met through a website for mountain bikers. And I said, there's this Venezuelan guy who's working in UK designing mountain bike suspension. I'm going to reach out to him for his advice. Years pass and we're friends through email. We're friends through email and he is interviewing. He is having a horrible time back in Venezuela. I mean, people are being kidnapped and this was fairly common for people to be kidnapped. I was kidnapped. One of my biggest accomplishments as an attorney was negotiating myself out of that kidnap. We got to talk about that. <laughs> All right. It was an interesting thing, but you know, he is having the worst time and he is interviewing for the biggest mountain bike companies in the world. And they all want to hire him. And all the attorneys for these companies tell him, listen, it's September. We need you in October. And the H-1B lottery is not till April. We're not going to be able to hire you. He's depressed. He knows I'm doing immigration related stuff and calls me up and says, hey, Diego, is this true? I'm like, Luis, we can have you here in 15 days. You've got patents. You own your company. You've had success. You've been published. I'm going to write an email to these attorneys. And I wrote an email. He called me up two days later and said, I'll be there in a month. And it was just when I saw how this person's life was completely changed just from, you know, the power of words, I said, this is my calling in life. And it's a, it's a wonderful field of work because in the morning we're working with an engineer who designs sensors for pipeline leaks. And then in the afternoon, we're working with a psychologist who uses dance as a means to improve self-esteem for battered women. So it's, it's just amazing. All right, I want to turn it over to Adriana <laughs> because, Diego, you, you can narrate this whole podcast, which was <laughs> awesome. And I want to get back to the kidnapping too. Um, Adriana, I'd love if you just could share what was life like, you know, just growing up in Venezuela and just also one of the reasons for immigrating to the U.S. Yes. So, well, we're both from Venezuela, same situation. We're the same age. We actually went to kindergarten together, which is we have known each other since we're two years old. Things happened. We went to the same college and then we went to law school at the same time here in the United States. We went to Texas. I went to NYU. I always knew I wanted to move to the United States. Maybe not move, move, but I wanted to study in the United States. My dad studied in the United States. My grandfather went to law school in the United States. So it was my path. I believe that immigration was a true calling for me. As an immigrant, especially, my family, my grandparents are all immigrants too. And they found Venezuela, the place to go. They're all from Europe. They have to move. Things happen. We all know what happened during the war. So... When I, moved to, when I moved to the United States, I knew that I didn't want to go back. 
I was in law school. I was having fun. My brother lived in the United States. He was, fortunately, he was born in the United States back in the 80s before me. So <laughs> I saw what I wanted. And we got this consulting company job, which we did a lot of work for them, a lot. We saw the potential of this business and how rewarding it is to help people to, I'm not going to say get the American dream, to build the American dream. And a couple of days ago, yesterday, Diego and I were talking like, what should we wear today? It's like, I don't know if we want to wear like BBA's shirt because it's going to look like we're a construction company. I'm like, yeah, we are a construction company. We build our dreams. We help them get there. A lot of our clients don't have a country to go back. A lot of our clients are from Venezuela too. A lot of our clients are from Nigeria or from the Middle East. And they know that going back or staying there is not good for their families. This is not a selfish decision that somebody's saying, okay, I want to make more money in the United States. It's like, I want to have a better life. I want to offer my family a better life. And for me, that was life-changing. When I saw that path and not just, this is for me, this is not about me making money, it's also about impact other people's lives. This is my true calling. I'm what I, I need to be. I love it. Oh, now, Diego, I know you mentioned this. I never knew this because I, mean, I imagine anybody listening to this podcast is going to be wondering. Like, they have to know the story. So you got kidnapped? Yeah. If you could elaborate on this. I was a faculty advisor for um, Model United Nations back in, in college. It was late at night and I was going back home. My house was pretty near um, a clinic, a hospital. And so, you know, I see some gu- some uh, 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 an SUV behind me and they're just, you know, honking or, or you know, they're really close. I figure, oh, you know, this must be some lady about to have a baby. Let me just move over so that they can pass. What happened was they blocked me and about four guys, you know, long guns came out and said, you know, oh, I'm being kidnapped. But my cousin's a psychologist and he, he says that I have generalized anxiety disorder. And the reason I was able to react the way I did at that point was because I'm anxious all the time. So I was already ready for the worst. So when I got out of the car, it was just like, okay, well, it's your turn to be kidnapped. Some of your friends have already been kidnapped. Let's see what you can do with this. So some luck played a factor into it because my my BlackBerry, this was down in the BlackBerry days, had run out of battery. I remember the last conversation I was having on that BlackBerry was with, with a person who, if they would have read that name, they would have kept me for a long time. But I, I remember just trying to breathe. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm completely blindfolded at this point, gun to my head. And they're, they drove me around in total for about seven hours, eight hours. And I was just very consistent with the things they said and very specific in the information that I gave out. Everything I said was not true. Where does your dad work? And I, because I was working at the courthouses, which were not a nicest area of town, um, I just gave very detailed accounts of why I was there, why I had the the car that I had. And by the end of the point, by the end of the negotiation, so to speak, throughout the entire kidnapping, I, I was I was just thinking about my parents. I was thinking, I cannot let them call my parents because if they receive that call, they are going to die. They are very nervous people. And that was all I thought about. I need to get out of this without them calling my family because they are going to be able to pay a ransom, but they are going to be devastated. And I don't want that to happen. So they drove me around. I gave very specific details, lies, but very specific. And eventually they just dropped me off. They took my car. They dropped me off at a tunnel. An ambulance came for me, stopped by, and I called them and they said, hey, mom, dad, you know, I was just kidnapped. I'll be home in 45 minutes. No, <laughs> wow, count your blessings. So I guess it's like uphill from there, right? It's, it's kind of hard to have a, a, a bad day after something like that. Coming back to you, Adriana, like just, I'd love you if you could just speak to kind of your two's working relationship. I mean, you guys have known each other, like you said, since kindergarten. What do the dynamics look like even in the firm? It is very weird that people here think either we're married or we're brothers and sisters, even though we don't look alike at all. But the thing that I tell everybody, we're always on the same page somehow. And where we're not, we are. We are always pushing for the same goals, which is all that matters. So we're very open. We're very blunt. We're very loud. I think we still discuss maybe every decision doesn't matter what how big or small is. 
maybe we just tell each other, hey, I'm going to do this and that's it because that's my role. But it's a great partnership. It, it is a great and partnership. Yeah. That's what we always write down. What are we doing? Great. What do we excel at? It's a great partnership. What, what do you think makes it a great partnership? Is it just different different kind of work styles, complementary skill sets, trust? What would There's you attribute to? There's a lot it of to? trust. Yeah. And there is a lot of understanding where each of us is coming from. Like we both started the same company the same year. We we have been like all the staffs have been the same. So we know what we don't want. So knowing what we don't want and we don't want to repeat helps to build what we do want. That's why we're here with Chris. That's why we are so focused on getting our business where we want it to be and provide the best type of services, not just for our clients, but also for our employees. Yeah. And I know you mentioned earlier, just this year in, in particular, I'm sure there's been a lot of adversity as, as always. I mean, I think it's impossible to grow a great organization without overcoming a lot of obstacles and challenges. But this year, getting on the Inc. 5000 list, fast growing private companies in America, winning premier firm of the year. I mean, it's, it's a lot of wins. What do you attribute that to? Like, Diego, I'll start with you. Like, are there specific things that you believe you're doing differently at your firm that kind of move you out of the average? Well, I think one of the things that has really gotten us to where we are right now is that we are both relentlessly curious about how to get better every single day. We will never settle. Like it's not, it's not the mindset of if it ain't broke, don't fix it is we are always focused on how can we be better? How can we be better? How can our team have a better life? How can our clients have a better service? It's always about, you know, just taking those little steps towards excellence and redefining what what excellent means because you know it, it, things can always be better and of course there is adversity in a business and you, you've talked about this and I, the nvidia owner i saw a video recently like they ask him if they told you, you would have to start the company again 20 years ago would, would you do it and it's like if i knew what i know today maybe i wouldn't at that point because they don't realize the adversity and i saw this quote the other day that said you know there's this trend right now where people are telling everyone like quit your job but become an entrepreneur and this 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 shit's not for everyone it's hard the level of stress that you have to live with you know and, and when you when your team grows and you realize this isn't about me you've got to provide for your team and you've got to help them build a better career a better life and that's that's a lot of stress on a person's shoulder but if you're if you're focused and you're committed to asking questions about how things can be better, it just makes it easier. It has been a great year, but we're just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. And Adriana, I guess turning to you, what, what do you what do you attribute a lot of the success to? I think that we don't stop when things get hard. I think the first thing that happened to us as business partner was, okay, we gotta change our whole practice model. We have everybody outsource. And we ended up that relationship abruptly and we say, okay, now we have to start hiring people. So from having everything figured out to like, say like, okay, this is the time. Let's keep moving forward. And if we didn't see it, the obstacles as an opportunity to improve, I don't think we'll be here now. And I don't think we'll be where we want to be in a couple of years. How would you describe the culture of the firm today? So it's crazy because I can't believe people are so into our culture. This week, we have a weekly huddle with everybody and a new hire within a week, she said, I have to say something. I have never worked in an office that they asked me, what do I like to do? Like my celebratory survey, things like that, ever. And this is a 50 year old person. She's like, I've never felt welcome as you guys have welcomed me in just one week. So people wanted to go to the office, people becoming friends, within the office for me is like, oh, wow, this is like crazy. I feel at home when I go to the office. I feel like I want to be there. From wanting to work out from home every day to wanting to go to the office every day, that's a huge thing. Yeah. And and we've got people in Argentina and Florida and Oregon. And one of the amazing things that happened this year is that we brought a lot of them for a weekly retreat, all of them. We brought all of them for a weekly retreat. And the first day, was a barbecue in my house. And these people had never seen each other in their lives other than through Zoom calls. I remember at one point, we were it's, it's just the two of us talking and we're looking at them in a corner. And Adriana mentions to me, it's like they've been friends their entire lives. This is 
this is amazing. And we felt incredibly proud of ourselves in that moment. Yeah. Now I want to shift gears a little bit just for anybody listening. I imagine this would be valuable to them, but just over the years, as we said, like a business is a series of obstacles overcome, but what have been some of the, if you look back, some of the mistakes that you made early on, maybe just some lessons learned or just there's things that you had to overcome to get to where you guys are today. A big mistake was not focusing on, on building the team initially and really focusing on, on, on getting the right people in the right seats. Business is like you said, a, a series of obstacles, but I would say that was one mistake. We've changed that considerably and we're focused on the team. I think, uh, um, I believe you guys have at some point you've, you've had a clean house, right? Yeah. Yeah. We had to, not everyone, not everyone can do that. 14 people. We let go around 14 people in just one day. And we were clear. We did, we did the numbers, the numbers of like how, how valuable this person was to the team and said, this doesn't make any sense. That was one of our biggest mistakes, I think, on the team. I think Adriana can probably elaborate. Not, not the cleaning house, but no. just the... No, not, not doing it from the start. Like when we started the law firm, we knew we had a great product. Like we knew that the way we do things, nobody does it. We know that our product is unique. Our client service is unique within the immigration space. But initially, we were focused solely on being the lead attorneys, not the leaders of a team. So we had to, to build out a team. I wish we would have started earlier building that team that we have now. Most times, I think, maybe not every time, but most times that we've outsourced, we can't get the people on the right page because it's not like we, it's, they're not It's apart. part of the culture. Yeah. So, yeah. so building the culture and having the team has been essential, but it was one of the first mistakes, not putting an effort into what the culture is, what the team needs to be, and what the goals are for the firm and the vision. I'll go an extra step. That it started before we knew that we had a team or people problem. I don't. We didn't measure anything. We just knew how many clients we were getting every month, and that was it. So, I will look at my QBO, or whatever, and say, "Oh, we're making money. That's good." We didn't know how much money we were making, like for real. We didn't know how m anything. And having now an understanding of how important it is to measure all these things has made a huge impact in the way that we handle any issue. Because now we can say, okay, if we have this obstacle, how much can we invest to get it done? Is it worth getting it solved? If it's worth doing that, not just money-wise, but company-wise. Because we had a vision, yes, we knew we wanted to represent immigrants, that was it. But there wasn't a goal, there wasn't a purpose, there wasn't feeling like, okay, we're doing this not because we want to get money is because we actually want to help people. So even if you ask me right now, I like my job even when I wasn't making money. I like helping people even when I was making $30,000 a year. I like it even better now. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> I know we've talked about culture, but uh, you, know, you, you guys briefly mentioned just even growing as leaders. What have been some of the ways or some of the areas where you've you know, developed as leaders and, and how? We didn't know we had a culture, right? Because we didn't have any type of business uh, mindset at that point. So we started doing weekly meetings. The one-to-ones help a lot, especially with most of our leaders to get where we are, where we want to be, and also where they are. I think it's very important to understand where those leaders want to go so we can help them achieve that. So the biggest mention that we always tell our anybody in our team is like, where do you want to go? We'll help you get there. Whether you start as a paralegal and you want to be an attorney, we can help you. But maybe you start as an intake person and then you realize you want to be a paralegal. Let's help you. One of our uh, workers, and she always wanted to do like a nail classes or things like that. And I told her last week, we're going to study your KPIs and your performances. So if you get there, we'll pay for your course because that's what you want to learn. That's what motivates you. That's what you want to get. I'll help you to get there. And I think that's been incredible for our team because they feel they're supported. They don't feel like they are just to make a living. They are there because we care about them and we care that for their well-being, for their growth, whether it's personal or professional, we're always going to be there to push them to get there. And I think for both of us as well, there's been a big mind sh mindset shift into why we do the things we do. 
right? So all I read about nowadays, and if you look at my Instagram, everything I'm focused on is, is on how to be a better leader. So when we have these one-to-ones, of course, we'll, we'll look into the business aspects of things, but I'll also try to try to get on a personal level on, on what do you need? What questions do you have? And I'll try to convey the information like, oh, I've been reading this book recently. You know, this might help you. Oh, you had this problem with a client. Look at Chris Voss's strategy on this or, or, or hey, you're having trouble with your time and we have a marketing team in Portugal. And this has been one of the nicest things that, that, that part of our team members have said. They, they told me they're in Portugal and one of the people that work for, work for us in the marketing team will tell us, you have no idea how many quotes from you we have written down on our dashboard. We don't know who gets more out of these meetings, if it's you or us. And I never figured this, this happened, but every time I talk to my team, I'm trying to convey the information. If I learn something, I'm, nowadays, I'm not learning it for me. I'm learning it for my team so that I can give out the information for my clients so that I can help them find a better way. If I can articulate my message better, that will give clarity and peace of mind to my clients. So how do I learn how to articulate better? So it's all about you know, this service mindset. And this was one of the things that you've said that um, has really affected our firm in a big way. We say service trumps outcome. We don't have a lot of denied cases in the firm because we have an extremely high success rate, but we've had people with their cases denied still refer out client to us because they'll say like they did a great job. The service was exceptional. I would recommend them. And that's, that's a win in my book. As you look ahead, Adrian, I'll come back to you. Just like what, what excites you about the future of the firm? Everything. I'm excited about organizing our business in a better way for everybody. So everybody knows where they have to be and how to get where they want to go professionally. As leaders, it's very hard for us. We're very eight on our print. So we like to do our things and get it done. Which is strong and self-reliant just yeah, for, for those sorry, listening that yes, are familiar with it. Yes. So that's where we are, both of us. So it's very easy for me or for, and for Diego to just like say like, you know what, I'll just do it for you. So we have to work on ourselves a lot to become the law firm that we want to be. Because learning to delegate is not easy when it's not on you. So it's a constant reflection. And I always blame it on me when something bad happens, not on my team. I always say like, I if you didn't do well, it's because I didn't train you. If you didn't well, it's because I didn't give you the tools. And I want to be the leader that can give you all the tools for you to make the right decisions, not for me to make do your job. Diego, what about you? What, what excites you about the future of the firm? My answer is everything, everything. I think we, we both are obsessed with BBA. It's our baby and, and we're very proud of what we've achieved. But it's like I said earlier, we, we are just getting started. And how do, we, how do we cultivate other leaders at the firm? How is everything better? And we are always asking on our partners meeting every time it's, how can we make this one thing better? Okay, let's look at it. What are some of the options? And we'll brainstorm and, and think about it because we'd like to be flawless. Markets change, tendencies at immigration services change. So how can we keep a pulse on what immigration is answering right now to certain arguments? How can everything be better all the time? And how can we not be excited about getting better? You run a marathon and you're shooting for 205. You're not going to shoot for 206 the next time. You're going to shoot for 155. And that's what we're always trying to do. It's a mindset and it's what we try to, we try to instill in our team, it's like, this can always be better. We don't like to stand still. I think that's the definition of both of us as people. And like, it's not even the firm. Like for me, standing still, it's anxiety. Like, it's like, okay, this is not what I want. This is not what I want. So we moved to a new office this year. I'm already thinking that my next year, we have to move to a different office. 
and it's already building all that inside it, but for good. It's like, okay, this space is up to capacity. I need to find another. Like in, within three months, there won't be more room for anybody else in the office. So, and that's exciting. That's That means that we're doing it the way that we want to do it because it's working. Well, you guys do deserve a tremendous amount of credit. Uh, and as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney Podcast, I'll ask each of you, Adrian, I'll start with you. What, what does being a game changer mean to you? Yeah, I've thought about this question a lot. And I told Diego, I know we're attorneys, but breaking the rules help. You don't have to feel, feed, feed them all. You have, you have to look outside the box to make a change in our employees and our clients' life. To be a game changer, you have to be relentlessly curious about getting better. Every single day, you have to be committed and you have to be patient. You have to be patient because people look at success stories and they figure it's, you know, snap up your fingers and it's, no, you might take two steps forward, one back, you're still going forward. You have to be patient and you have to be committed. It's a long road. It doesn't happen overnight. So it's, and as long as you're curious about getting better and trying to find ways to be better, you can be a game changer. To close out this episode, we're joined by Jan Dills, founder of Jan Dills Attorneys at Law, the largest female-founded law firm in the nation. Jan's built an extensive and reputable legal empire with offices spanning across the state of West Virginia and a dedicated team of over 150 professionals. Her firm has successfully represented thousands of individuals across various practice areas. During our conversation, Jan elaborated on an experience she had early on that holds a special place in her heart and forms the core of her mission. When I was 12 years old, my aunt lived with us because she was ill with cancer. We went, um, I, was, I did everything with my aunt. And so she went to the Social Security office and I tagged along, went into the waiting room with her. And she was um, denied at that point. And I really didn't process what happened. But I, I remember sitting in that waiting room and, and the tears coming down, their shoulders rounded and just the, being dejected. Um, going back into her car and, and watching her just break down. That's really what, what drove me when I for, did my first Social Security claim. I was like, this was what happened um, so many years ago. Fast forward, I bought, ended up buying the Social Security building, and I made sure that my office was in the waiting room. Um, so And where my desk is is where I sat. So I always want to remember that. If you fast forward, has it been, it was 30 years? 30 years. Yeah, it will be 30 years in May. Wow. And, uh, and just reflecting on that, now one of the largest social security disability firms in the nation, I believe the largest female founded law firm. Just what do you, I mean, you look back on that, you don't strike me as someone who reflects on things like that often. No. But just seeing all the progress that you've made and the, the clients that you've helped and the team members that, you know, as, as you've grown the firm, are there any particular things that s stick out in terms of, investments or decisions that you've made that you believe contributed to a lot of that growth? I think um, a lot of the challenges that I, that I, that any firm faces makes you better and stronger. So I think some of the challenges throughout the years have really made a difference. Um, just the challenges of battling the um, state Supreme Court um, on advertising, that whole thing was a, made us stronger. Having some health challenges which really made me focus on the foundation of the firm and, and making sure that the firm could run without me if, if needed. It hasn't needed to, but in case. So I think any challenges that have happened has made us stronger. Yeah. And I know the culture is, is huge for you and at the firm. And sometimes people throw around this buzzword culture. How would you define the culture of your firm? The culture of the firm is, you know, for me is, you know, how people behave and act and make decisions when you're not around. I am in a in, in a stage in my life where it's all about legacy and in developing my team. And so um, you go back, the culture is going back to our core values. The key ones are, you know, they're all important, but clients center focused, collaboration um, and communities and community and giving back. And so it's it's more of um, the mission of the firm, making sure that we're all on the same page. The culture of the firm is a learning culture. And so we're constantly self-improving, um, not just because of work, meaning being better at your job, but being better humans, having better human goals and on our one-on-ones. And so the culture is more of a learning culture, but not just for the work, 
but for the, the person in general outside of our virtual walls. And I'm curious what the core values, is. they're all start with C. Yeah. There's, there's five of them. How did those come to be? Well, we had them a little bit different when 2008, um, when we s- sat down and talked about who we were and we had to define that. Now it sounds, you know, easy, but it was it was difficult at the time at trying to identify who we were and, and putting that da- those down into, into words. But it came about just on who we were and how we defined ourselves. And then we kind of put them in C's. We already had a couple easy C's, community and client center focused and continuous learning. So those were the easiest ones. And then we just added the other two. What about just the importance of, of having core values all together? I mean, I, I know some firms, they, they hear it and they say, okay, well, we're going to sit down, we're going to meet with our team. We're going to come up with these core values. We're going to put them on a poster. We're going to put it on a wall. How do you actually you use these core values yeah. in the firm? They're ingrained in everything that we do. Our 360 uh, evaluations, our talks with our, our employees, they're always um, go back to the core value. We have a most valuable play, your most valuable team member um, on a monthly basis. It goes back and we have to define it under, under the core values, why they should be deserving of that award. When we have a difficult conversation with a, with an, with a team member, it always goes back to the core values. They're just so part of us. We wouldn't do that because that's not client-centered focused. So it makes things a lot easier and we're talking in the same language so everybody knows what to expect. Yeah, it's like, it's like a it's like a code that you can continuously reference, and you, right. you always know where here's our north star. Yeah. here's what great looks like. Here's how we all align. Um, what about just the different things that you do within the firm, like to engage your team? I know you invest in in your team and their development and their growth and learning. Even before getting into some of the specifics, just I guess the mindset around doing that, the mindset around a great culture, the mindset around investing in people. Like not everyone shares that. I'm just curious that were you always that way, or was there something that you? Know, I was always. That? I'm. I mean, I'm always been that way. But I didn't. I wasn't very successful at it. Always thinking you were getting culture uh, to a certain point, and you think all oh, things good, and then one thing would happen. One thing, and it's usually when you're out of town, of course, and it would just bring all that tumbling down and and the lack of trust. And it was just, I would go, I'd get a little, get to a plateau and think I'm doing really well, and then I just get my feet knocked out under underneath me. And so it's just a matter of. You, you want that culture to be when you're not in the room that other people are on the same page. And we're there now. And, and I have to say that's been a, a, a direct result of uh, hiring our, our current HR and our director of culture. And she comes here to Crisp on the, the leadership track and all the different tracks that you have here and helping her develop. So that's been a really key part of the development of the, of the culture. And, and just it's a non-negotiable. Culture is non-negotiable. You might be a great person uh, as far as a um, worker. You might be a great worker. and But if you're not a good team member and you're not a good fit, which is core values, then you're not going to work here. And so just having that as a non-negotiable. I was even thinking as you, as you were sharing this, I think one of the great challenges of, of scaling a business is the increased complexity that comes with increasing headcount as you're adding more uh-huh. people. This, the just yeah. getting all these different individuals with different skill sets that come from different backgrounds to align and work together to achieve a common goal. And I think that's why you need culture, right? Because otherwise, without it, you just you put a bunch of players in a room together and they can have different strengths, but then they'd never work together and it would just be problem after problem. You know, they don't have a common focus, a beacon or what you say, the North Star. And so everybody's might be great, but they're, we're not all on the same page, even though you might think they are. You're just you're not always in that room. I think that's been a key in growing from, you know, in 2008 where I had 26 team members to now 150. What about uh, talking about client experience? I know this is obviously very, very important to you. This is an area I know you and I have spoke about this in the past. It was very difficult to to let go of or to take your foot off of to an extent of allowing and empowering other people to be able to focus on aspects of this. But I guess talk about the client experience at the firm. So there's several different things about client experience. You have the client experience once a, a client becomes a, a client. There's prospects, they're inquiring about the firm and had that process. But the client experience, we've always been core value. It was an easy one to saying client center focused. And that has been just an ongoing process. You, you, you can't ever just think that that's all good. So there, it's, there's a whole different sets of things you need to do to make sure that client, you have client experience, reducing friction of um, becoming a client, reducing friction of 
clients giving updates, the client experience, that they are number one and we are delivering the highest um, amount of service and advice and legal expertise that they deserve. And so that's just a whole process that entails a, a lot of things. When you're starting a firm and you have just a few clients, you can work with every single one of them one-on-one. -on -one. You can ensure that experience is perfect. But now when you're working with thousands of clients, it's how do you make sure that it's done right thousands yes. of times every single time? Back in the day, I mean, I know there's a lot of lawyers now that won't even understand this, but in 1994, and I, you know, I signed every client by 2007. I had had six offices. I was driving to all those locations, doing them in person. And that's great. But when you reach thousands of clients, tens of thousands of clients, and then that becomes not a way of you can sustain. So you, you have to have systems and processes and procedures, making sure that everything you, going into, we have um, intake software that we have developed on our own, case management software, um, making sure that you're, you're, you have all the manuals, SOPs, um, all those things that are important that this is how you do it in every single instance. And we have three lines of business, so we have to make sure that all three lines are done the way that it should be done and continuously auditing how those, what those procedures and processes are. That just takes a lot of um, diligence among my team. That's not me. It's them making sure that we have operating, standard operating procedures that the manuals are up to date. We have online training on the videos. Um, we have a whole uh, Jan Dills Academy, all those things to making sure that the client experience is the same through all, through all three lines of business. So let's go, uh, I guess, even bigger picture talking about leadership and the importance of leadership. I know we, we've been talking a lot about the fact that, you know, leadership is intentional influence. How do you operate as a leader? And then what are some of the key traits that you see in some of your leaders at the firm? Yes. So I, I think this has developed over the years. I, I was never, I wasn't one of those natural born leaders or I just worked hard. And at some point you can't scale by working hard. Obviously that's a nice trait to have, but it's not, it's not going to get you and a scalable business. And so, first of all, I, before we had these mastermind groups and Chris Becks and just reading books and, and trying to go back to school in your own field. And, and luckily, I had a business background in developing that because you're, as, as you develop in your team and as your firm, there's only going to rise up to where you are as a leader. So, if you have a ceiling, the firm's going to go to your ceiling. And so, for the firm to grow, I had to grow. And I, rec I recognized that and, and, and just started doing that, stepping back, going to workshops, things like that. And then when I joined Chris Bax, um, I knew that that was a, a good fit for me. We had same, similar values. Um, you talked when the first summit, everything that I, have, I believed in and I was trying to teach my team was part of the, of the summit. And I think that growing and investing in yourself as a leader and as, in that growth, and then that allowed me then to invest and grow my leaders. And that's where I am now is legacy and growing my leadership because now they're the ceiling and it, the firm will only grow as much as they are, are as leaders. And so just developing them as leaders and be invested in, in their growth. And when you look at some of the leaders within your firm, are there any specific types of characteristics or even skills that, that stand out in, in some of those leaders? Definitely my, the leaders in the, my firm are self-starters and problem solvers, um, but they're also willing to learn and understand that they don't go in the room knowing at all. And they might have an idea, but not, but being curious, but the continuous learning is part of all my leadership individuals in the firm. So I think that is a key attribute for us. Yeah, I agree. I, I was, uh, you know, I was, I was reflecting on some of our leaders. I always see coachability. They ask for feedback. They want to know what can I do better. They, of course, come in with humility, but they just, they're always willing to learn. I find that the best leaders are the ones that are coachable. And then, you know, I guess converse of that is some of the leaders we struggle with are the ones that have it all figured out. I have it all figured out. And I said their lack of the self-awareness, I guess, is part of that. Being aware that I, I, there's more out there that I need to learn is important. And, and that's, I learned that from being in sports. 
yes. younger. Oh, absolutely. Sports, I think, is the ultimate meritocracy. And it's, it's interesting because we all, you know, when people watch sports on the weekends, they see that the players who make the most money are the best players. And the ones that get the most opportunity are the ones that are contributing the most on the field. And people love when they see that on, on the weekends. And they're like, but then somehow when it comes to real life, they say, well, why does it have to be a meritocracy? Right. <laughs> so it's just interesting. The things we admire in sports sometimes don't, don't translate the same way to, uh, to the real world. It's, it's good for them. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What advice, I mean, just looking ahead uh, for people listening to this podcast, uh, let's say they're just starting their law firm, maybe they're a few years in, maybe they've been doing it a while, but they've plateaued and they want to go to that next level. It, uh, any advice you would give to other firm owners or other leaders just from experiences that you've had? I guess there's a couple levels of it. I mean, the first thing I would say is always go to the foundation. Make sure that your foundation is good. Make sure you have the basics down, right? So you have your core values, you have your manuals, you have your SOPs. Um, you have your foundation that will then um, allow clarity within the firm. Make sure you have your vision and, I mean, and your mission, but also being willing to to learn and to grow as a person. And be willing, Michael, you've been very good at this for me, is get outside your comfort zone. Because if you're if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. And that's really beneficial for, for not only for yourself, but for the firm. So I think this in different levels, foundation, continuous learning, and being uncomfortable, and of course taking risk is part of that, but calculated risk, but just being, just growing as a person. The saying, I'm sure everyone's heard it, it's like, it's about the journey, not the destination. And, and I find that sometimes when people are very early in the journey, they want to skip a lot of steps. I think it's good in a, in a sense, if you've got great coaches and mentors that can help you n n not make the mistakes that you would have otherwise made. But... I also find that, to your point, the foundation is so important to, to lay that foundation and not wait 10 years to try everything else and then now focus on laying the foundation because all the scalability, all of the growth is going to come from the infrastructure in the firm, the people that are there, the alignment, the culture. And if you neglect these things, you're ultimately going to have to focus on them at some point. And it's a lot more difficult as you have more people and more complexity. That's, that's correct. And being part of CRISP is that you're constantly with worksheets, development, definitely make me uncomfortable on, <laughs> on several occasions. And so being part of CRISP and CRISPX and being in that room with other like-minded firms that are so much more successful than, than me is just in, inspiring and just motivating. And so I think that's been a key, key part for us. This definition has changed over time, you know, for all sorts of people, but I'm curious from your experience, how do you define success today? And has that changed from how you would have defined it back when you started the firm? Oh, I, I mean, it definitely changes, I think, as you grow as a person and then you become you know, immature in my 20s, um, you know, 30s, just working hard and, and 40s, finally saying, OK, this foundation thing needs to happen. So I think, you know, how would I define success? First of all, health is wealth. So God has has taught me that for sure. Um, but success would be, for me now, is legacy. Um, making sure you're doing the right things and treating people correctly, giving back into the community uh, and where you live, being a, a better person and helping your your team members to be better people. And that's where I am in, in, my, in my journey. So Jen, as we come to a close, I know I asked you this before, but what does being a game changer mean to you? Game changer at, at this point, um, I think that's changed over time too. Again, I, I hate, I'm going back to this theme of, of giving back, having a legacy, um, just really caring for your clients, for your, your team, not just saying you do, but you do. And success and being a game changer is not about money and making the most money, but it's about changing people's lives. And so I think a game changer to me is about changing people's lives, not only your clients' lives, but your team members. I'm gonna give a huge thank you to Ryan, Bo, Diego, Adriana, and Jan for taking the time to join us on this episode of the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. And I wanna congratulate them once again for winning the coveted Firm of the Year Awards at the 2023 Crisp Game Changers Summit. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that I can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of my book absolutely free at GameChangingAttorney.com. 
Number two, you can shoot me a text at 404-531-7691 and I'll answer any question that you've got for me. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it'll help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on this episode, see the show notes in your podcast app or visit legalpodcast.com. Legal Podcast.